I'm uh, I'm acting as a technical lead at the uh, new business R and D, which looks at everything that's not cameras. So the latest thing we produced was a access control system, which is the one that controls all the doors here, for example. And um, for myself, my own strive is to be a key player, not a star player, but a key player. Uh, in sports, when you look at key players, it's the one, it's those players that build up the team. It forms a spine, and uh, acts as a plas platform for the star players to excel. And uh, even in working life, it's the same thing. You need people to do stuff together for specialists and experts and those who are really good in some special field to perform. If, if we got someone that's really, really good in optics, he can't do anything if he hasn't got the software to produce the images to the management system, for example. So I started looking at the roles of the team and I started writing and I got to a point where I didn't like it anymore. I thought it was too generic. It was putting people in categories that didn't quite fit. It was too abstract. So instead, I rewrote my speech. And today, we're going to look at eight different patterns that I think are more practical. It doesn't hold a lot of, in Swedish, uh, uh, specific terms that's really common in management courses. But instead, we will look at some more practical stuff. Um, and these patterns will help you lift your team and, and on the same time, um, how do you say, uh, lift yourself forward and show, your, show off yourself in a good manner. So first off, let's, let's have a small mapping since I talked to some of you and I noticed that not everybody do software, right? So who, who, who does software here? Semi, semi, <laughs> okay. So let's so let's let's uh, let's hear. What do you do? Uh, I'm more of a coordinator, uh, working with the different devices, uh, working with the requirements, uh, focuses of the okay uh, system. Okay, requirement specifications, <coughs> and elicitation. Great. Someone else who didn't put up their arm. Volunteer. So I will point at someone. You got a computer, so you're safe. <laughs> <laughs> or not? Websites? Great. Are you at the front? Yeah, I'm more of a web designer. Okay, great. English guys? Okay, uh, cool. So, n nobody who has n never been in software development and uh, is familiar with agile movement and traditional waterfall development and stuff like that? Your students. Okay, yeah. great. Welcome. <laughs> okay, you should hook up with Baldwin then. He tests. He tests my. <laughs> yeah, great, great. Because <laughs> uh, Baldwin tests my software, <laughs> so he's my pain. <laughs> um, so what what I do as a technical lead, uh, agile development is something that we have just adopted at Axis. We used to do a lot of traditional, we were, we have a tradition of electronic development being the controlling factor. So I am, a, as a technical lead, I'm both a scrum master and the software architect. Uh, and I help to do requirements, elicitation, I do bug solving, I, I host workshops, I pour up coffee for the specialists if they want to. Uh, and we will get more into detail where, where I have used very different skills to solve different problems. Um, so yeah, let's move on into the more <coughs> patterny stuff. So our first project that I participated in, in New Business, we started the agile, agile movement where uh, uh, one thing you usually do is morning stand-ups. You get together around a board or some gathering point and you talk about what you did yesterday, what you are doing today, and what stops you. And basically we were 20 people, which is a lot for a, a, a scrum team, which is usually 
a thumb, thumb rule is seven or eight. And we basically formed a circle, and everybody waited for the turn and spoke quite in the same pattern every day. Nothing new. Nobody actually wanted to show off their weakness, was the feeling. And, and I was standing there thinking, why doesn't the tech lead, I wasn't tech lead then, or the project manager sort this out, it's so inefficient. But it wasn't their fault. Um, the thing is that humans has a, have a tendency to, um, to misinterpret others', others behaviors or intentions and why they do stuff. They usually, humans usually try to blame others for mistakes that we do as a group. The thing is about, you, you shouldn't put the blame on others, instead you should look into, why, do, why, does we st why do we stand in this circle? Well, it's basically a status quo. It works for some. The project manager and the tech lead got, it and got, it, got their uh, updates, so they would probably not say anything. The ma major problem is the other 18 people standing in the circle and thinking this is dead boring. It doesn't give me anything. And that is another pattern with which I will go back to later is questioning the norm of the group. But this is the first thing you have to think about is stop blaming others and look at the entire, sp entire group to see where the core issue is. It might be difficult, it might take some meditation, but don't be so fast about pointing fingers. It usually is a group behavior, a norm. And when you do get critique yourself, it's usually that they misinterpreted your intentions. So don't take anything personal, keep it professional, and um, try to lift the perspective. A bit. I will get back to that. I, I got a, a quite good example of where we go back to the stand-up thing. Um, yes. So, how do we solve all these uh, different problems uh, if we go to the core issue here? Um, well, the first thing you can do as a team member, or one of the most important things, is to clarify. Ask for clarification if you don't have it. Um, it can be goals, it can be roles, it can be tasks. Um, when you got, um, when, we ev when everybody got the same picture of the problem, then you as a group can understand where we, where we are going and why. Uh, and usually it's as simple as asking. But the problem is if you ask, you show that you don't know. But, and that, the, the natural instinct is that is weakness and I can't show weakness. But, but when you ask, you show that you're interested and you show that you want to learn. And it can be as simple as when we had uh, the first access control system, the one that I was helping to produce, it had a product type in this configuration, the entire build system that compiles the different modules that said, this is an audio product. And I was perplexed. I didn't know what, why. We don't have audio. This is a, an access control system. So I started asking why. Why is that? Well, I it's because we don't want the video parts. OK, why don't we want the video parts? Yeah, because we, said we are an access control product. But yeah, that I know. <laughs> but what is it really that's happening here? And then I got an, exp it basically did, I asked why a couple of times and it came down to that the product platform isn't a Linux firmware uh, per se, it's a camera firmware. Uh, we have been producing cameras for so long, so when we came with an access control product, there were parts that were used to having video. So by turning it off, we couldn't just say, this is not video, we have to do the audio way because there had been a special product for that a couple of years ahead of us that had been sorting things out for us. So that was a shortcut. But that, that, um, that understanding helped me and the th I didn't get um, taken down by it. I was 
they, it was a positive experience for the group because there were other people that didn't know this either, but they didn't take, they didn't dare to ask why. Um, so this, uh, I don't know the English word, something. Consensus, very good. And it, it, it benefits consensus and it prohibits um, another English word, thought fatter the meaning. Assumptions, very good. Um, so, and it can be as easy as asking, what, what should I do? What is my part in this common task? And then there is no assumptions that might be colliding. Some task that might be going between chairs or lost. Or it can be that two people do the same thing and that's in inefficient. Um, and this showing interest and weakness problem, uh, it's always beneficial, I think. Is it someone that's felt this way uh, by asking I'm, I'm showing weakness? Like today? <laughs> Nobody here ever got an explanation that they didn't understand and didn't ask about it again. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. You were first, so please explain. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, actually, I don't remember the particular instance, but uh, uh, I recognize uh, one of the other theories that you described. Yeah. Yeah, so, so th then w when that f um, environment has been built up in the team, then we got, we got a different group behavior that we need to solve. And w as a team member, I can do that by, by, by being open and telling others to be open about, about things. Uh, in Swedish, it's called talk, high talk, high in ceiling, that it should be okay for anybody to question things. And that's a, a hard thing to get a team to do. But as a team member, if I start doing it, then perhaps the next one can do it as well. And, oh, yeah? Can I share? Yeah, share, so share. We haven't prepared this, so. <laughs> I, I got so excited about this. I, I noticed uh, when I was starting out that I, I did one of these things and I started to ask some questions. And people were really, really helpful. And I learned a lot. And then I started noticing that other people weren't asking questions. More or less, it, it's like this. Even in access where we try to uh, encourage this a lot, I, I have this quick question, uh, and then we can see in the second one, Jacob, you can relate to this, and we are getting spoilers now. What do you do if you don't know anything? And uh, the right answer is always, the people, they always say, ah, then I, I will ask, and then the people come in and start working, and they don't ask. And I think uh, the more experienced people are, the more they ask, and it's because people are afraid. And when you have the status of you're the guy that knows everything, when he asks the question, no, nobody is going to assume that he's he's stupid or something. They've already established it. Except for managers. <coughs> managers never ask questions. They never show this. It's, it's what else do you really ask in management? <laughs> <laughs> go-to guy for any sort of question about this and uh, he was very I wouldn't say condescending but almost a little bit in the way that when you were talking to him he would ask a, fo a follow-up question back to you uh, in a way that would make you feel that uh, he was really uh, pushing you and maybe testing you and seeing to see what you were capable of and that was a little bit intimidating at first until yeah. I realized Yeah. <laughs> 
about what are you talking about, what are these things? And when I started asking those questions, he kind of softened them a little bit. He actually started explaining. <laughs> That's a great example. Yeah, well, <laughs> We will, we, I will come back to conflict management. Uh, did yeah, you? Yeah, it comes there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is also a question of um, um, understanding each other and having consensus, thinking that you have it, and actually having it first. Yeah, yeah that's a, that's a I know this all the time that we, we can have a discussion and come to an agreement and everyone knows what to do and you haven't spoken about the same thing really. And you <coughs> notice that after, after a week or after two weeks or after after it's too late, maybe. Uh, so, but that's not a, a few. It's a, a question that may not get that real consensus. Yeah, we 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 actually had the same thing. Uh, the product project I'm working on now. It we had a study before that that just kept going and going, and um, then I was introduced to the project and I. I was looking at the different questions we were trying to investigate and find ans answers to, and there was answers. The thing is, they didn't know which to choose. So the, thi the first thing I did then was, why don't we t make a decision? Well, because there are so many to, do to choose from. And who should do it then? By starting asking those questions, uh, to try to work for an effective problem solving or uh, decision making, I started to make the group take steps because uh, all the information was there. It was just meant to be compiled and identify the people who were supposed to make the decision. And so we did that and two weeks later the project ended. And it was scheduled to uh, go for two more months. And I wasn't tech leader either then. I was just a normal mortal engineer who got frustrated. So you have to speak up and that is actually pattern number three. Try to to work for efficient problem solving and, and decision making. Keep it simple. You, know, you want to analyze the problem. You want to see which options you got. Then you, sh then you decide. This way we go. It, does, it doesn't mean it has to be you. you. Then you get the people that can make that decision. And then you see, how did it go? And then we do it again and again. And then we got, if we do <laughs> the same thing multiple times, people get warm in their clothes and we get more efficient about it. It doesn't have to be uh, quite so complex or complete. We can always change it later. And when these this prototype study ended into this um, new project, I, I thought to myself, if I, I'm, I'm pleased with being mediocre, then why should the team be awesome or, or performing at its best? Then, so I, I said to myself, we have to turn up the volume here and really kick ass. Uh, so I started to encourage these these norms that support productivity and innovation more. A, a problem we usually have with our web user interface in our cameras is that the, there isn't any tests. There are there are manual tests that Baldwin and his team does, but we don't have any automated tests for the developers. So when the when the UE guy came to me and said, can I do tests? I said, yes, sure, do tests. As simple as that, I had supported his, this new norm that we should do tests and we should re be really, really good at it. So the next guy came to me and said, shouldn't we do better tests in this field, this new area which we haven't got any tests either in? Then yeah, sure, let's do that. And all of a sudden, we have gone from a product project style that was basically you develop everything first and then you test to everything should be reviewed, tested, and delivered to the uh, quality assurance team in a matter of two weeks. And then we do it again and we deliver feature for feature 
and we, it was a, such a radical change to what we had before. But by, by me starting to encourage these simple things, these small norms, the bigger norms were being questioned and changed into being more productive and efficient and innovative. And what about, b b what about the other norms, those that were, that were there before? Here, here we had an example where there were missing norms with the tests in the web user interface. Do you have, do you have any norm for, say, anything that blocks you or irritates you? It can be as simple as going, there is a, a mandatory, let's go to breakfast at nine together. Or you should be at work 30 minutes before you start to just hang out. Do you have any s of those examples? No? Okay, I got one. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's great, it's great, great pro. You're forgiven, you students. <laughs> um, but if we go back to the stand-ups scenario, that was a norm that was in place, but it didn't quite do, it didn't perform as well as it could be. So someone had to question the status quo. And again, uh, it's there for somebody. In this case, it was the tech lead that wanted a status update from everybody. But then you, we go back to this uh, consensus thing. We, we, should, we should agree upon this. Why, why, if it doesn't work for everybody, then ask why. And you clarify the, your intentions and you, and you get some consensus on why that we do have this norm. And perhaps it shows that the group isn't happy. So we changed our stand-ups into two stand-ups instead and quite specialized. So it was the UE guys had their stand-up and we had our own. We were, we were firmware developers. And immediately the discussions changed from being I did this yesterday and today I will do this. It came <coughs> to start to being like, I got this issue. It's burning over here. <laughs> Who can help me? And immediately we had a problem solving environment instead of just standing still and doing your thing. Yeah, we had some issues with that. So the desire was to get that, but the, uh, the way we changed our way of working in the middle of the project. And then before we did this change, each person had been in separate modules. And uh, so I was in, s in charge of user distribution. Someone else was in charge of user interface. And um, so we didn't have the knowledge to do that, but we had the knowledge to do some parts cross-functional. So firmware developers could act in different areas. UE developers could act in different areas from the product perspective in feature ways. But we couldn't, I, I, I can't do web development. I suck at JavaScript. Th that's the way it is, I can't do that. So when they started doing so when they started their discussions, I it didn't work for me. And I hesitated to ask. And they started to hesitate. And then we were standing in the circle. So when we broke down into two separate groups with some, some specia specialization that was a common factor, then we got to better discussions. Okay. Usually, it works framing it so that people <laughs> people uh, don't have to. Do we work at well? We, we I think we have not one of them, but huge support. Uh, but the one issue is that uh, we, we were trying to uh, always make things better, and we tried uh, Monday meetings and Tuesday meetings and blah blah blah, and it, it's getting better, and then it's getting worse. I think it's 
policy makers making changes when we don't know what we should change into. But all this maybe we describe. But I, I, I think it's extremely uh, important to speak up. But you have a point as well, that if people are just meeting a food cafe, discussing how work could be better, they wouldn't actually be producing anything. You, you have, in, in the end, you have to produce a product that somebody pays for so you can get paid to sell them. Uh, so so it, that could actually be a problem. People are just always in meetings and they discussing how to do things and not actually getting anything done. That, that could also be a part. It, do, it doesn't have to be uh, necessary that people are, are primarily discussing it. It could be right the other way around. We actually had that on our team that we were just discussing and discussing and nobody actually did anything about it. And the thing we did was that we we said that we don't have to have the perfect solution. We will have this meeting again in two weeks. In between those, let's try something. If it works, it doesn't, kill your babies. And then we try something new. Uh, it's it's not Usually we tend to try to look for the perfect solution and we think we've got it. When, we've, when we think we got the perfect solution, we hang on to it because it's our ID. We should be proud of it. But if we don't attach ourselves to it, don't take it personal. Like I said first, don't take it personal. Look at the group behavior instead and try to work as a team. Then we can always try it out. <coughs> we had we had it, this example where we sat in meetings and nothing happened. So what we tried to do was first, let's find solutions at the meetings, but the meetings never ended. <laughs> so the next thing we tried was deal out action pointers to different people. So you would get one pointer and you would get one. And then you come back with a solution or something that you have tried out and present that this is how it went. What do you think? <coughs> so that's uh, what we did. I don't say it works for you, but a small tip. Um, and it all came down to this uh, environment issue we talked about earlier, that it should be open and innovative. And you should be allowed to speak up. And uh, something that can, can contribute to this is um, um, the team feeling. The, the feeling that we, you and I, we belong together. And when you got that feeling, that bond, it usually leads to communication uh, that you are and you are being more committed to the team and general generally being pleased with what we do and not being unhappy and this is something that we actually has a, a core value about at axis it's called act as one that we should we shouldn't be we, we shouldn't hesitate about helping others. So I'm in a, a small, tiny little team that's by ourselves. We are almost like rogues. We're, we don't follow the same processes as any, anyone else. And we don't have to cooperate with anybody else. But we do. We do still do that. Because in the end, we work for the same company and we need to help each other out. And usually it pays off. Um, it came down last week that we had an API that needed a review. But we don't have any API experts on our team. Those are in the, uh, in the big video R&D organization. But by being nice, they were being nice back. And um, it, can b it can be as easy as doing something together, like having breakfast together or lunch or um, what we do in our team to add to this team feeling is rund pingis. Uh, there is no English word for that. We tried it out with our English guy. He didn't know the rules at all. It's, um, it's usually a, a sort of table tennis when you go round the table and y when you get at the uh, batter spot or where you hit the ball, then you got one try. If you miss, you're out. And you don't get to, you, it's about keeping yourself going around the table and then you get to the final where the two last people show up and then you got a winner. This we do every lunch. It's quite fun. So it started with our team who are about seven people 
and then the neighboring teams started to tag along and we usually form up about 25 to 30 people every lunch. And it's quite nice. <laughs> I have some notes there. This could be interesting. <laughs> but that's okay, they were old. So, and w when you work about this feeling of teams, then when we get to conflicts, like you said, it could be difficult. And once again, keep it, keep it professional and don't take it as a, a personal insult. And as you said, you had a senior, a senior programmer, I guess, that came. I, I have had the same thing. When it comes to um, shell programming, bash or dash or whatever you like, that you can't say at Axis. At my first team, I got, I got hammered because I wrote my first shell script and I didn't have a clue about what to do. I think you know who it is I'm talking about. And a, se a senior developer sat 10 feet from my desk he, who goes up when I first pushed up the commit and yells at me. I, are you totally stupid? And I had to bite my tongue <laughs> a tiny bit. And I, I tried to keep the discussion as objective as possible. And I tried to meet him at, at a professional level instead because he was really mad. Because I, I introduced what's called bashisms, which is sort of a special dialect of shell that's not approved by the Axis guidelines. But I didn't know, this was my first shell script, I was fresh out of school. And that was my reply. I didn't know this. Well, you, well, you should. <laughs> it's your job. Well, I didn't know it was my job. And what we basically did was, I started asking questions. How do I, how do I get to know more? And we basically saw that this was a common problem for the entire group, <coughs> that, that the new developers weren't introduced to shell programming which is a central part of how Linux start up the system. And therefore it was crucial for Axis and therefore it should be crucial for the, dev the new developers. So this senior developer, he got to start a class. And so he was happy now. He got to educate and yell at people in class instead. And the shell, scri shell scripts improved. And um, it wasn't my ID, I shouldn't take credit, but it was a matter of by just confronting him in a, in a professional way, made him look up from being angry and correcting code to actually doing something positive about it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So he went from being a pain in the ass for everybody who, was, who were new and scaring them off from the shell script and never learning it to being a key player because he lifted the entire shell script knowledge in the team. And he became the go-to guy also for questions because he had opened up once, then he could open up several times. And if you do this confronting in a professional way, you come out as a professional as well, uh, in the way you look, and as a team team player. Um, and don't, d d one of my first thoughts was to go to my boss and say, hey, this guy is bullying me. But then I'm not a team player either. I'm a snitch. And um, that doesn't work. So it was better to just confront him and talk about it and find a, a solution instead. What was the core issue? Well, it was that new developers didn't know enough about shell programming. And um, as a final point, we, we had this stand-up situation where I was very e easily tempted to blame the, the leader of the situation, the tech lead here or the project manager. Um, instead, of, instead of blaming them, I should be supporting them their efforts to bring the team together and pull in the same way. Um, I, 
so the next time your leader asks for help, do a volunteer, uh, ask clarifying questions to get that consensus. Because then you will, you will be shown. Uh, you will show off yourself as someone that wants to help, someone that wants wants this consensus, and you will promote a better team environment. And you will you even if it's a, a, a small tedious issue. As uh, I used to work at a convenience store when I was studying, and some of the biggest issues was taking out trash. You have to look at the bigger the bigger picture. I wasn't picking up trash. I was making the store nice and welcoming for the customers. And the same is for solving bugs in software. It's it's not about doing this bug, it's about making the entire product the best of best in the world and taking pride in that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, don't don't be hesitant to help out the leader or take responsibility for something. Uh, I got one of my developers, he, he used to be a, a true coder cowboy, shooting from the hip with spaghetti code and uh, all things that makes me tremble as a, <laughs> as a guy who wants tidy and stuff. But he, he stepped up when we created this welcoming, innovative, productive environment where we promote efficiency. He, he, he stepped up and took responsibility for our function test suite because he truly believed that he could make the product better. And uh, then I'm not the team member that's, that's doing it. I'm the leader he's helping. And I'm, I, I'm not displeased about him taking responsibility. I'm truly, truly happy that he wants to take part and help me out. So that's the, the, the thing is that if you do these things we have talked about today, you will lift the entire team and you will come out as one of the key players that makes the team the team. That actually makes the team the, the successful producing factory that it is, or special environment for somebody. Um, and I would like to recommend Susan Whelan's books uh, about being a how to make an efficient team. Because that's actually not written for management. It's written for us as team members. And they don't have this difficult jargon. And it's quite easy to read. So I can recommend those who are interested in this area that there are nice books. <laughs> Susan Whelan. Yeah, sure. I don't have slides, so we have to do something. So you got Susan. And that's Wheel. Wheelin. And easy, easy to read. For those of you, is she's both in English and Swedish. And the Swedish translation is actually good. It's not Google Translate. And uh, so it's it's quite nice. She she she's basically compiling all the research in this field and 